it's a pleasure to be with you. I've, I'm in the Leaders of Organizations Network at the moment, but I, my heart is very much in public policy and, and, and stuff. But what I've been asked to do with you this week is not so much public policy as um, more, more in, the, in, the field, in the field of, of apologetics and engaging with people of different worldviews. And so what, what we're doing is, is taking some of the modules out of a course that we've used and developed for Christian medics on, on how to engage uh, faith-wise. And, um, and I'll say a little bit more about that. So in terms of where I'm coming from, yes, I'm a Kiwi. I was a general surgeon. Uh, people say that for those two reasons, I'm much more comfortable with words of one or two syllables than, than, than longer ones. But I've, I've benefited from my engagement with the English. And, and my wife and I came to the UK in 1989. We were just, uh, I think I was 30, she was 29 years old. And, and uh, we'd intended to go back to Africa where we'd been, where we'd been working as, as uh, medical missionaries. We thought that was God's plan for us and it was different. He called me out of clinical medicine into student ministry and I, I did that for nine years with, with uh, Christian Medical Fellowship which brings together about 5,000 doctors and students throughout the UK and Ireland. And then after that, uh, my predecessor Andrew left. The student job had been, yes, I'll this is like treasure in the field, uh, what, a, what an honor. The CEO job was, Lord, let this cup pass from me. But um, so I, I shifted, I was CEO for, for 18 years and a lot of that work was, was involved in ethics and, and advocacy and public policy and that, that kind of, of stuff. And uh, during that time for, for 12 years, I led a group called Care Not Killing, which was doing end of life advocacy, trying to stop uh, the legalization of euthanasia in, uh, in uh, Britain in particular. And then uh, for my sins, just three years ago, I shifted out of, of uh, CMF to the international organization, the International Christian Medical and Dental Association, which is a, an umbrella body which brings together over 80 national associations of Christian doctors and dentists uh, around the world uh, for all issues at the interface of Christianity and medicine. So part of that is, is about public policy uh, as well. So uh, what, what I'm doing for you today, we, we have a course we developed at, at Christian Medical Fellowship to help students and juniors initially to, uh, to share their faith and answer questions. And, and we've expanded that and adapted it. And I, I'm just taking five modules out of a, a course, uh, which we're going to do in a contracted way. The, the course is usually 20 modules, so it will, it will raise questions and, and we, we uh, we teach this actually uh, to medical students and, and, and doctors online and small group adult learning things over a 10 week thing with a flipped classroom approach where they watch a video, read something, answer effective questions and then come together for an hour and a half. So it's been really interesting to see uh, people from different worldview backgrounds and different cultural contexts because we have uh, we're engaged in countries which are everything from majority Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, uh, atheist, uh, or uh, Christian theist as well. And so bringing people together from around the world is really helpful for them to understand that the, the cultural milieu in which they live is, is not necessarily the one in which other people live. And it needs a different approach and different context to, to do it. So with no further ado, we're going to look at modules one, two, seven, eight, and nine uh, in this course over the, two, over the two sessions, one and two in this one. And, and we start off by just thinking about the, um, the concept of a, of a world view. There's a German word which I won't attempt to pronounce uh, there uh, because there's no real word in the English language which describes it. But, but a world view is... Uh, it, it's like the set of glasses one looks at to view the world. And uh, we're not aware that we're wearing these glasses. But we come to the world with a whole presuppositional framework. In other words, things that we've already accepted as truth that seem self-evident to us. And we look at the rest of the world through those glasses. And, and therefore, it affects all the interpretations that we make and has a profound effect on, on what we value and the way we act and the way we behave and the way we speak. 
so uh, the overall perspective from which one sees or interprets the world, or if you like, a collection of beliefs about life, the universe, and everything, which uh, could be held by an individual, or it could be held by a group, and it may be uh, a consistent uh, worldview, or it may be a mixture or, or, of, of different worldviews. So uh, this is an iceberg, and uh, there is a part of a person that we see as visible. That's, that's what's above the surface. And that, that, that's essentially people's behavior and their speech. The, what they say and what they do is what's visible to us. But what is beneath the surface is not visible. And, and often people don't think about what's beneath the surface. So if you take, take a Richard Dawkins, for example, who, who uh, got into a lot of trouble recently, you know, the, the evolutionary biologist, and he got into trouble by tweeting in response to uh, someone who said, look, I've, I'm carrying a disabled baby. And uh, the, the thing about Dawkins is he's actually quite an impulsive person, which uh, meant that when he was uh, writing books that took a long time from writing to publication, and he had all sorts of minders around him, uh, advising him and saying, look, Richard, you can't say that, and so on, uh, what he put out was really quite measured. But, but in the world of social media, uh, when it's just him and the computer and the impulsive immediate response, he, he said a lot of things that got him into trouble. And one of the things he said in response to this woman was, carrying a disabled baby, abort it and start again. And, you know, you can imagine the reaction. But, uh, or, or you, might, you might think, you know, for example, a, a young eye Jenner who is vegetarian, has decided never get to get married, and uh, wants to, um, uh, have, has decided never to have children, and, and has a whole set of views about climate and ethics that sort of related to that. So both the Dawkins and the young I. Jenner are expressing ideas, and they're behaving in certain ways, and that's what we see visibly. But beneath the surface, there's a whole lot of things that inform that. So firstly, there's a set of values about what they regard as right and wrong. But that set of values is itself based on a set of beliefs about what they think is true about the world, the universe, and everything. And that set of beliefs is, is, is in a sense, is based on a, a worldview, a whole set of presuppositions about the nature of reality that we're, we're going to unpack. Uh, so what we see is just a small component. And the problem that we have often in public policy and public square debates is that the engagement is only at the level of those things above the surface of the, of the water. And we're not probing more deeply to have the much more important deeper discussions. And so the danger is that it just becomes a dialogue of the deaf where people are expressing their opinions and getting heated and angry with each other rather than more reflectively unpacking, you know, why is it that you feel so passionately about this issue? Uh, I remember doing this in an African context, of course. They said, what are icebergs? Um, and, and they said, if you talk to Africans, you've got to contextualize your communication. We would suggest a hippopotamus because all you see above the surface is the ears, you see, and the eyes, but there's a huge amount below. Anyway, you can think about that. So um, now, I'm a doctor. I'm, I'm a surgeon. Uh, we, we joke in medicine that a surgeon is a physician with an extra skill. In fact, you know, we, we say to the physicians, because there's a battle between the two, is we say a surgeon is a physician with a skill. But fundamental to medicine is the idea that you, there's no treatment without diagnosis. And, and yet we make diagnosis on the basis of signs and symptoms. But if, if someone comes to you with a set of symptoms and you uh, do your treatment based on the symptoms without making a proper diagnosis, you, you're going to mismanage them terribly. So someone says, I've got pain, and you give them painkillers. But you don't ask, well, what's actually causing this pain? They might have undiagnosed cancer. Or they've got shortness of breath, and you give them some kind of anxiolytic to quell their anxiety. But you're not... Uh, working out whether it's heart failure or chronic obstructive airways disease or asthma or something, 
uh, and you're not making a proper diagnosis. And, and so we often engage without making a proper worldview diagnosis of where people are coming from. And so therefore our interaction with them is going to be very limited and at, at a surface level. So well, how do you make a diagnosis? We, you ask a whole lot of questions. How do you make a worldview diagnosis? Well, uh, and I'm simplifying this to some degree because I'm a, a surgeon and a Kiwi and I like simple things, but there are six fundamental questions that you can ask people which will help you to diagnose their world view and therefore make it easier for you to have a meaningful conversation with them. And so the first question is the theology question. What is God? You know, does God exist? If God does exist, is God personal? Is God inside and part of creation or outside it? Is, uh, con is creation or, or reality contingent upon God? That's the God question, the theology question. Then the second question is, is what are human beings? Uh, are they just uh, the, the product of matter, chance, and time in a godless universe? Are, are they just clever monkeys? Are they no more relevant than any other species? Are they spiritual beings part of the whole totality of reality? Are, are, they, are they special creations made in the image of God for relationship with them? So that's the anthropology question. And then the third question is, um, how do you discover truth? The, the epistemology question. Is truth something to be discovered by the scientific method only? Or, or, is, or is truth something that is intuitively felt, that, that there's a kind of resonance that tells you that's truth? Or, or do, you, do you find truth by looking inwardly at your feelings and your beliefs? And, and that's a, an idea that comes from Romanticism through the Enlightenment movement and, and is, is a fundamental foundation of the, of the whole sort of woke philosophy that we're meeting at the moment. Uh, or is truth something that uh, you know, might be discovered by the scientific method? We can trust our senses and deduce laws about the world. But is it also something that is, if there is a God, revealed? And if so, how, how is it revealed? Is it through prophets, and which of those prophets are true, or is it through scriptures, and so on? So that, that's the epistemology question. And then the next question is the values question. Do human beings have significance? If they're just clever monkeys, do we value them on the basis of their characteristics, their, their, their um, mental faculties, or their physical faculties, or, or, or their appearance, or, or the, the amount of functioning neural cortex they, they have, uh, or uh, are they just, do they have no more significance than a rock or a snail? So the value question. And then there's the ethics question. How do we decide what's right and wrong? Do we have some kind of external scale, or is it something, again, that we look inwardly to discover? Do, do, we, do we look to leaders or you know, prophets or whatever? And then the, the last question, which I think is one of the greatest discriminators of all, between people is what happens at death. Is death the end? Uh, Bertrand Russell, when I die, I rot. Uh, or is death a gateway to something else? And, and what, what is it a gateway to? Is, is it a gateway to uh, some kind of disembodied existence of the soul? Uh, or is it a gateway to coming back into this life in another form, reincarnation? Or, or is it a gateway to judgment? And, and, uh, and two destinations of heaven and hell? And if so, on, on what criteria is that judgment made? Okay, so you've got these six questions and you can, uh, th you can use them to make a worldview diagnosis. And if you're trying to apply treatment without making that diagnosis, you, you'll be missing the boat. So if, you, if you're a Kiwi and a surgeon, you want uh, monosyllabic words to help you remember it, it's God, man, truth, value, ethics, and death. Uh, well, it'll help you to remember that. So, and again, I'm simplifying, but I, I put it to you that there are actually four major categories of worldview uh, in the world, and they change in proportions over history and in different cultures as well. But first of all is the pantheistic worldview which is the idea behind Hinduism, Buddhism, and the New Age, which is the expression of pantheism in Western culture. We'll, we'll come back to these. Polytheism, 
this is the worldview that was held by most ancient societies. So all of the great empires we read about in the Bible, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Greeks, the Romans, and so on, were essentially polytheists. And there are far fewer polytheists in the world today, but they're still there. And uh, in, in behind animism and folk religion, we have a group in Papua New Guinea that most of the people in Papua New Guinea are from a polytheistic or, or animist point of view, many in sub-Saharan Africa as well. But many uh, people from the Indian subcontinent, from a Hindu background, are practically speaking polytheists. They believe in a whole variety of different gods who they've got to appease in different ways. And then the third category is theism, which of course is the worldview behind Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, and all of the, of the cults and sects associated with them. So within that category would be Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, and, 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 and uh, you know, Ahmad, Ahmadiyya Islam, and, and so on. And then uh, the final category is the atheist worldview, behind naturalism, existentialism, nihilism. So th there's these four essential categories. And so by asking these six questions, you can determine the presuppositional framework from which a person is coming, which will help you to understand why they hold the values uh, they, and the opinions they do about particular issues. So let's just uh, think about that simply in terms of these six questions, God, man, truth, value, morality, or ethics, or, 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 and death. And uh, theists, Christians, Muslims, Jews, all believe in a, a personal supreme being who created the world, that human beings are made in, in God's image. Uh, we'd say as Christians and Jews, uh, Muslims would say that human beings have some of God's qualities that other animals don't have. That truth is absolute and it's revealed by God in, in various ways. That we have value because we're created by God for a relationship with him. That morality is what's in line with God's nature that is right and wrong is an expression of his morality or, or purity. And that death is the end and it leads to judgment and uh, either heaven or hell. So there's, there's, there's no participation again in this life. Consciousness continues and there are only two destinations. And the theistic religions will, will vary on, on the criteria by which you end up in one or, or the other. Uh, polytheism, multiple gods, that we are, as human beings, we're lower rational beings. So we're, we're lower than the gods, but the gods themselves are quite fickle and we would say sinful and self-motivated. And, and we can't see them, but they have a profound influence on everything that we, we do. <coughs> Truth is, is something that's grounded in tra tradition, picked up from the elders, passed down over time as part of that tradition. And... Um, our value as human beings is related to our place in the hierarchy. So the gods are the highest, and then there's us, and then there's other, other beings. And morality, it, it, it uh, boils down essentially to a kind of might versus right, might is right view that, that um, it's determined by the strongest. You, you, you do what the gods say or determine or demand, or you'll be in great trouble. As a result of it, you'll be will be cursed or blessed, and and when you die, you enter into the spirit world. You, you I don't know if you've seen the film. I'm sure you've seen the film Gladiator. But you, you know that when he's stabbed and he's dying, and you know he's coming, and there's this door, you know, and he he goes through, and he's entering into this new world where actually he does recognize his wife and son and people he's known and and. It's, it's similar to this world, but, but he's a more kind of disembodied spirit. This is the idea. I grew up in New Zealand, and, and this, this view is very, very strong in Maori culture, that um, you, become, you die, become a disembodied spirit, and then you migrate to the north of the country and jump off into the sea and go off to this, this new land. So, and then there's the pantheism, um, where there's not a personal god creator, but, but God is, is more an impersonal life force that is contiguous with the whole of, of, uh, of reality. So not separate from the world, as we believe as, as theists. 
and human beings are part of that whole totality of being and truth is something that is that is not revealed but it's it's subjectively felt or or, or uh, gleaned intuitively and, and you might have certain things that will help you along that way, like chanting or crystals or um, uh, the various rituals that you go through in order to discover uh, truth. And uh, we have value because we're part of the whole totality of being, but, but there's nothing special about human beings. Uh, morality, uh, it, it, again, kind of intuitively felt. It's quite interesting how... Um, pantheistic cultures, especially like India, have been so welcoming to uh, things like abortion. Now, wh wh why is it the, these very spiritual people um, seem to accept wholesale abortion? And, and, and it relates to the, the, um, the, the value that, or, or the idea that you can almost graft any kind of morality onto a pantheistic worldview. And then uh, death, it's not the end, but you come back into this life. It might be an, as another human being, but it might be some other thing. And then uh, in different pantheistic traditions, it's all about escaping from this cycle of birth and rebirth and re-entry and so on. And uh, Hinduism and Buddhism have different approaches to, to that. And then atheism, very simple. God doesn't exist. Death is the end. We're just clever monkeys. Um, and value, morality, are all very arbitrary. Truth is only what you discover through the scientific method and so on. So you've got these four major categories. And I'm not saying that everybody fits smoothly into these because many people are inconsistent. and They've, they've taken a little bit of something from everywhere, a kind of smorgasbord worldview. But uh, these are the fundamental categories of, of worldview. And that, that these are the six questions for elucidating them. So if we think about the, the culture in which we live uh, at, the, at the moment, um, in uh, what, what, whatever society we're in, there will be a number of uh, mountains, if you like, or uh, structures or institutions which are determining its future trajectory. And the trajectory of a culture will depend very much upon the dominant worldview of those who are who are mastering these institutions. And so in, in uh, Europe now, where we're moving from a predominantly theistic culture into a deistic culture, and then into an atheistic culture, then the people, uh, the, the direction of our societies is shaped by the fact that the majority of people in positions of power, whether it's parliament, the courts, universities, the worlds of media, art and entertainment, business, medicine, law and so on, that most of them are now coming from a, an atheistic worldview perspective. So we're, we're, now there are variations across Europe and different places, but that's uh, the direction of, of travel. We did some surveys on this. We used to have a, when I was in student ministry, we had this worldview survey and, and it was six questions, these six questions. We added another one about Jesus. And it was multi-choice, which medical students love, you see. So we, we, we hand these out in the common room. They, they, we say, mark these. Uh, they come up to the computer, we run them through, and then we give them a philosophical palm read. And, and they go away and say, oh, I'm an existentialist. What's that sort of thing? And then, and then that will give you an opportunity to talk to them. So it was a, we used it as an evangelistic tool. But the fascinating thing is that I never met, in the years we did that, I never met one person who could not answer every one of those questions very easily. So when you ask them to reflect on what their worldviews were, they had very specific, every, every one of them had a worldview, but most of them didn't realize that they, they had one. And, and you can see the medical students here, 65% atheist, 5% pantheist, they're generally Asian backgrounds, no polytheists, 30% theism split between Muslims and uh, Christians with a few Jewish students. Now, what, what's really interesting is that um, if you look at patients in the UK, uh, it's, it was, until very recently, 65% theist, 30% atheist. So the most common consultation that's taking place in Britain medically is between a theistic patient and an atheistic doctor. And it doesn't matter too much about the educational level as well. So if you if you're looking at medical students and you go to different cultural contexts, 
uh, then you know Thailand they're all they're all Buddhists uh, in in um, India that they are many of them are Hindus or practically polytheists go to Poland they're all theists who go to uh, the Soviet Union most will be atheists and so on so what do we learn from this well uh, there are at least four different worldviews or, or worldview categories if you if you read more academic sort of high-level non-Kiwi, non-surgical books about this kind of thing, then people will wax lyrical about the all, all, all things. But I, I, I think simplifying it, there are four major worldview categories. They're all held by intelligent and well-educated people, and yet they are mutually exclusive. I mean, God can't both exist and not exist. Death can't lead to nothing and reincarnation and, uh, and uh, you know, heaven and hell or whatever. Um, the, in terms of truth, the, there, is, there must be a reality out there, and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, the, there was a time, we went through this postmodern period, where, when, uh, you know, people were saying, you know, truth is what I perceive it to be, and so on. But we're, we're now come out of the, the obvious nonsense of that, and, and we live in, a, in a, a time when most people have very, very strong moral views. The seminar Dave McElroy is doing on the self-righteousness of woke culture. Very interesting. You know, when I was a student, uh, oh, you're a Christian. Oh, each one to his own, mate. That's what they'd say. But, but now, oh, you're a Christian, so you're a homophobic bigot who believes in a pestilential God. You know, there's a morality now. And I think we've moved through this idea of, of postmodernism and relativism to, to a sense where, where people generally do hold very strong views about things but might not know why they do. So the worldviews are mutually exclusive, so no more than one of them can be true. And so what that tells us is that many intelligent people in the world, educated, well thought through people, people with, with uh, college degrees and higher education and so on, hold to a worldview that's not actually true. In other words, they have fundamental beliefs about the nature of God, man, truth, values, life after death, whatever, that are false. And so they're living their lives on the basis of false presuppositions. And, and of course, so if you think about life after death, if, if you've lived all your life like uh, Bertrand Russell thinking that death is the end and then suddenly you're dead and consciousness is continuing and then you realize there's a judgment, uh, it's going to have re very real consequences for you. Uh, uh, some of the atheists might argue if, if you've lived all your life um, thinking that there was a God and uh, you die and there's nothing, then perhaps you've wasted your whole life fruitlessly uh, for something that, 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 uh, you know, that didn't happen. So, um, and I, I, I don't, we've got to press on to the other bit, but um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that when we dialogue and engage with people, let's really attempt to do it at a deeper level, not at the level of the dialogue of, of the deaf, but uh, at a deeper level where we're asking searching questions, helping people to reflect both uh, on what they believe and why. So uh, if people believe discrimination is wrong, and equality is right, then to ask them, you know, where did they actually get that idea from? Uh, and and it's, it's not anywhere there in an atheist worldview, and yet most atheists believe this. So I think it's a, a, a useful skill. So make a worldview diagnosis, get to deeper levels in conversation, and um, so on. So, so number two, so the, the question is, first we've looked at is, different worldviews that people hold, but let's focus now on theists, people who believe in God and judgment and, um, and reveal truth and so on. Here's a list which I, uh, I think that these are the things that make it distinct. The authority of the, the Bible, both Old and New Testaments, that it's, it's God's revealed word, the divinity of Christ and by implication the Trinity, Christ is the only way of salvation, the death and bodily resurrection of Christ are so historical facts, the centrality of the cross, and uh, salvation by grace through repentance and, and faith. And uh, th th these really are discriminators uh, from other 
uh, religions. And, and fundamental to it all is the divinity of Christ. And so we have to be pretty clear uh, that we believe this and why we believe it and be able to point in scripture to uh, why it is. If, if you're debating with a, uh, a, a Hare Krishna pantheist and, and uh, you say, Jesus is, is God. No, 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 Jesus never said that. He said, I and the Father are one. Something quite different. Um, or Muslims, no, Jesus, Jesus spoke God's word, but it, because he's a prophet like Muhammad. These are the passages, and, and um, particularly talking to Muslims, you, you know, and, and people from cults, you need to be able to go to, to those. They're all there. But, and the divinity of Christ is, is based on a whole lot of, of things. Firstly, that he created the world. No one else, but we're told that Christ was the agent of creation. Well, it can't be other than God. He, he, pre he existed before his birth, talked about the glory he had with the Father before the Son was made. He claimed that he was the only way to God. And uh, not only that, in John 14, 6, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, he says to his disciples. He claimed to reveal the Father. He claimed to be the Son of God, which we know is a messianic title that is divine. And he called himself the I Am. So he used the secret name of God, Yahweh, in his debates with the Pharisees. And that's exactly the reason why he was crucified. That was the key question at his trial. Are, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? You know, yes. He claimed to be one with God. He accepted worship. Always a great question to ask Muslims. You know, what, why, why did Jesus accept worship when, when Thomas said to him, my Lord and God and worshipped him? Why did he not say, oh no, I'm only a prophet, you must not do this. This is equating a man with God. He accepted the title Lord, he gave, forgave sins, only God has the power to do that. He claimed he'd raised from the dead and he said he would return as judge. And the scriptures make it very clear, in John 5, Jesus makes it very clear that he is the agent of judgment on the day of judgment, but only God judges. <clears throat> so, Thanks. So the, the, the point is that, that other non-Christian, world, non-theistic worldviews and theistic worldviews can appear on the surface to be very similar. You take, take Muslims and look at the degree of similarity between the worldviews. You know, we, we've, got, we've got a belief in one God, we've got a common history going back to one figure called Abraham who lived a specific period of time. It's belief in scriptures and prophets and judgment and the day and in the in the um, <clears throat> life after death, uh, and many of the prophets are shared with, between the two faiths. And as as we teach in another module, uh, using the similarities between your worldview and theirs to create a bridge for dialogue, to then establish a relationship, to then move on to asking the searching questions about the things that are different is an apostolic uh, technique of evangelism and apologetics that we should make good use of, rather than majoring initially on the things that are different. And uh, this is just a, really a final question, um, and perhaps we'll do this, maybe think about this in plenary, but last night's talk was really interesting uh, from, from John Stevens. I don't know if you're there at the plenary. So there's this whole debate, isn't there, between um, you know, about, about what constitutes an, evan uh, an evangelical. And John went for 1 Corinthians 15, you know, and said there's the first things of, uh, the things of first importance, which are talking about Christ's incarnation, his death and resurrection uh, and appearances and that he specifically died for our sins. So the, the justification by grace through faith is right at the heart of the things of first importance. And then he made a distinction from that and what uh, the Bible calls disputable matters, that these things that are dealt with in chapters like 1 Corinthians 8 and 10 and Romans 14, you know, the foods you eat and whether you esteem some days more important than others. So there's the things of first importance and there's the disputable matters. And then 
there's a whole lot of stuff in between which he was talking about being secondary issues. And he gave examples like the role of women, uh, your view of the end times, you know, that's the place of Israel and so on. So things on which are concerned and uh, committed Bible-believing Christians hold different convictions, but they're not actually uh, relevant to salvation. They're, they're not salvation issues. They're not primary. And then you, you'll notice that then he came back to this question of ethics. I thought that was very interesting. And he talked specifically about sexuality and specifically about homosexuality which of course is one of the big issues that we're facing today and one of the major attacks on, on uh, the Christian gospel is in the whole area of ethics. And, and he quoted a couple of texts, uh, two of which I've got up, up here, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10 and Galatians 5, 19 to 21. And the interesting thing about both of those texts is that they, they both contain the statement People who do such things will not participate in the kingdom of God, not be part of the kingdom of God. They're outside the kingdom. And yet these things relate to ethics. And, and he went on to say that this, this issue of sexuality is actually primary. And, and the question I want to leave hanging with you to some extent is this question about ethics and morality and whether it is, as some people are saying, just in the realm of disputable matters, you know, like holy days and foods and so on, Christians can have any sorts of views and practice on these, and it's okay. It's uh, just we should tolerate these things in one another. Or whether it's more fundamental and important than that. Because I think this is a really key question when it comes to public policy and speaking in the public square and uh, being a witness to the truth of the gospel. And I've, I've listed there another couple of scriptures that you might want to, to listen to. But, but the, you know, the obvious thing to anyone listening to, to John Stevens' uh, talk last night was that if you go to these passages in scripture, two of which he quoted, homosexuality is definitely mentioned in, in all of them, either specifically or as part of the category of sexual immorality, pornea, if you like. But it's not the only thing that's mentioned. There are a whole lot of other things relating to ethics and, and practice. So I just leave that thought with you.